Okay, good morning, Fiona. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me today. So February, I believe, if I can get it right, is um, Dog Training Education Month. And so that's why I'm excited to talk to you because, um, as you know, I have four dogs. Yes. And um, one thing that I know for certain, and I wish other people realized this when they got dogs, is that training doesn't end at the puppy Never. class. <laughs> Never ends. <laughs> it's like always happening. So I had the pleasure of working with you um, with Zoe and I was able to take what you, you know, just basically the little games and stuff that you taught me with Zoe and apply it to my other dog. So I'm excited to say that the return and I had the cone out in the yard. Rodrigo yeah. now understands that. So whenever he goes running Good. off and he's about to go next door, I just shout out return and he just goes in a circle and comes on back. <laughs> yeah. So everything you teach to one dog for any reason, you can always use something similar, tweak it a little bit for every other dog that you have or every other dog that you work with, which is really nice. It is. So what made you get into dog training? Um, well, I've always been that kid who has a bunch of Barbies, but only wanted the vet set and Barbies ended up in a corner under a bed and I had all the animals around. Um, so everyone, of course, you know, in the nineties, you, everyone's like, oh, you'll be a veterinarian, <laughs> but much really about dog training. It wasn't really taken very seriously. And so of course I went and worked at vet clinics and pet stores and it just wasn't right. And then I found um, where I'm currently working at the dog spot, which is a doggy daycare. And then I fell in love with just the intricacies of communication that dogs have. And it's like, I'll just stand there and I'll be mid sentence talking to somebody or training someone. And I'm just like staring at something. They're like, wait, hold on. What, what's happening? What's happening? I'm like, don't you see this? This is amazing. And I totally know what you mean. <laughs> Um, so that really got me into it. And then I got my own dog who has some disabilities. Uh, I find that they make her even more special. She's deaf. So then that really forced me to really pick up a lot of training techniques and really understand dogs on a different level than having a dog who can hear you and can see you all the time to having a dog where you really have to figure out what they're saying because they're not, it's not as easy to communicate with them as it is with a lot of other dogs. Yeah. So that that really just made me fall in love with it even more. And now I've been training for, properly training for roughly four or five years, but I've been assisting in classes since I started working um, at the daycare. So it's been roughly eight years. Yeah. Wow. That's but, a long time. Yeah. It's, I realized that the other day I was like, wow, that's well, okay. <laughs> this, I'm not new to this. <laughs> you know, I love what you said about watching how dogs communicate. Cause just the other night, um, Rodrigo, who's our oldest dog, he's almost eight years old, and then Scout, who just turned four last fall, were having an interaction with each other. And they usually don't do the rough play with each other, because I feel like there's kind of this dynamic of who's in charge, and I worry that it'll go from play to fighting. But I decided to just let them work it out and figure it out. And it was so funny, because usually um, Scout would always lay down for him you know, and roll over every single time. But this is the first time that Scout didn't, he like was giving as good as he got. And <laughs> it was like so exciting to see because it's like, obviously Scout's confidence has gotten up and Rodrigo, he didn't get upset by it. He was like, yes, now let's play. <laughs> and it was so funny because it was just like, my boyfriend was like, you know, Rodrigo. And I was like, no, 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 let's just wait and see. Let's just wait and yep. see. We, did. we sat there and just watched them interact for about 10 minutes until they were like, okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting to watch those dynamics. And it's very hard for us to know if we should cut them off or if it's fine. And we, we always have owners or even for myself, I'm like always making sure that I'm not cutting them off too soon, but I also want to be involved if it's necessary. So it's once you start to learn their body language and, and trust those dogs and really start to get to know them, you can really let them do their thing because they dogs know how to speak dog. They, they got that. They have no problems with that. And it's hard for us to speak dog and, and when to interfere. So it's really nice to kind of let the reins go a little bit and just let them kind of figure it out and step in if you need to, but letting them build that relationship and that communication with each other really nicely. So um, given your experience and, you know, working at the doggy daycare and seeing so many dogs, what is a common mistake that you see um, dog parents making when we're training or just raising our dogs? 
It's, it's mostly the, the communication because we're, we're completely different species. We're, we're trying to figure out how to communicate and work with dogs. And because I find that because we're so used to dogs being a part of our lives for so long that we forget that they're still not human. So we tend to put a lot of human emotions on them and, and say that they're, oh, they're jealous or, oh, they're doing this behavior because of this they're as much as we would love to think that they're in depth like uh, a big novel or something like that they have a lot of complexities but it's they keep it very simple so what they're saying with their body is what you need to listen to and not interpret it in a different way than you then they're showing it to you um, so there is there it can be complex and intricate and and confusing but once you really start to get the hang of it and just really watch and learn how dogs are communicating, then it makes it a lot easier when you're seeing it. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm working with owners, I try and really point out, oh yeah, they're, they're doing a little smile, but that's because they're nervous, not because they're happy or mm -hmm. different tail wags and stuff like that. That can all mean different things when you're in different scenarios. So yeah. it's, a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you say that because I've learned, you know, by working with trainers, um, well, Zoe, because you, and you've met Zoe, is when she was really little, um, one thing that we noticed is that when she was next to me, she became really owner possessive. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't know that that's what she was doing, but a trainer is the one that pointed it out and would have me stand like five feet away from her. And all of a sudden, she's fine. Yes. Play, yeah. But when I was close, she was like, oh, I got to guard this. This is my human, so I'm going to guard my human. And it was interesting when, when you met her, just watching your interaction with her because she was so nervous. So you wouldn't look at her. Sometimes you would let her smell you and wait until she was comfortable. Then you pet her and you took so much time working up to the point where then she was now coming to you and looking at you and interacting with you. And because of that, I'm, I have less pressure when other people come over. So when mm -hmm. someone comes over, I just explain to them, just ignore her. She just wants to check you out for a while and eventually she'll relax. And yeah. it's interesting because I think it, you know, I don't remember, I think it was like probably last spring when we met. Yeah. And over the past year, the time it takes for her to get used to a stranger has gotten a little bit shorter. Good. Time. So thank you for that. Yeah. Sometimes just having those little tidbits of oh, okay, that's what we need to do instead. Just that little change rather than, because we greet people, like if we were here in person, I would go straight up to you, shake your hand, hi, how are you doing? But a dog would prefer, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Look away, just stop. Eating. So those little bits of difference on how people communicate with each other and how dogs prefer communication, they do learn that it is different with a person. So they might greet us differently than they greet another dog. But there's those little subtle differences that if you add those in, makes a, a huge difference for some dogs. Right. Especially high ones. <laughs> so, um, you know, one thing that I learned, especially when I just had Rodrigo in Sydney, I had litter mates. And so it, that was a challenge of training two puppies at the same time when they're so focused on each other. And um, so they were pretty rotten for the first few months. <laughs> and um, a trainer once told me, you know, you can change – a dog's you know behavior or you can train a new or train them out of a bad habit mm -hmm. you know you don't have to just deal like oh well this is just the way it's going to be <laughs> and so i was wondering if you can talk more about if if you've trained bad habits into your dog you know one of my bad habits with rodrigo is that and i see this all the time <laughs> it comes to me on the third rodrigo yes <laughs> always the third one so can you turn that around definitely so you want to keep your goals realistic. So if you have an Australian Shepherd or like your guys, they're very active herders. You want to make sure that your goal is realistic and set them to be successful. So if you notice, okay, it's on the third time he's, he's recalling, how much importance is it to you for you to change that? Is that going to work out for you guys? You know, he's older. Are you good just sticking to it? Or do you really want to put the time and the effort into changing it? Because if you don't want to commit to changing it, and you just work on it here and there, and it's not consistent, and you're not really helping them through the change, then you're not going to find the consistency that you're looking for. And it can just be more frustrating, more on our end, because they're still going to do what they're going to do. And they've, they've formed that habit. They got it down, no problem. But then we want to make sure that, or when I'm working with somebody, that I really want to make sure those goals are realistic. So recall for your dogs, 
all right, find a new word rather than Rodrigo, maybe have return or a different mm -hmm. word. I always tell people just use banana, just <laughs> yell banana. That could be their recall word. You're going to look crazy, but that's totally fine. I'm going to back to you. <laughs> um, so as long as you're willing to commit to the, the effort and the energy and the time that it's going to take, it, it's going to take a little bit longer, but there's always a way to, to train a dog to do something that you want them to do. Um, and especially if you find something to make it fun and enjoyable for them, they're more likely to practice that behavior with you anyway. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, when someone's new to, you know, raising dogs, you know, what do you want them to know? Like, or even let's go back even further. Like when someone's choosing a dog for themselves, they're ready. I want to be a, a dog mom. You know, <laughs> what, what do you want them to know just about, you know, like, choosing a breed and yeah. sticking to that training. So there's a lot of breeds out there. There's a lot of great breeds and all breeds are great. Don't get me wrong. I have my own preferences, but I love all breeds that I interact with at some point during my life and training uh, time with them. We always feel that bond. But when you're looking at your lifestyle, you if you're in an apartment and if you have a really chill lifestyle, you, you work and then you just come home and relax, you want a dog who's going to fit that. Or if you're really active and you take a lot of runs, you definitely don't want to get a little Shih Tzu or a little Dachshund who's not really capable of keeping up with that. And if you do get a dog that's different than your lifestyle, you want to make sure that you're accommodating, I'm so sorry, <laughs> accommodating to their lifestyle. So if they don't fit in with every part of your life, they're not going to fit in, into every part and you need to make them successful with what they're comfortable with. So if that means you take them on a walk and then you take them home and then you go for your run, then making sure that that's something that they fit into. Um, as well as not just getting a dog for how they look. That is um, a pretty big thing for me, especially lately with all these designer breeds. A lot of them I find have great qualities and they fit into some great homes. But if it's not your home that they fit into, then that can be really tough on, on everybody. And you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole and it doesn't quite, quite mesh all the time. So learning about the dogs and, and talking to trainers, I've, I talked to several people um, throughout the year just saying, hey, I'm getting a dog. I don't know what yet, but you know, mm -hmm. what is something that exactly the question you're asking, what is something I need to know? Well, do some research, <laughs> look around, look for breeders in your area, look at, at shelters and rescues and just ask people questions and if they're willing to answer them then that means that those outlets are going to be better for you so if you're asking a breeder is this breed for the right dog for me if they don't want to answer your question don't contact them again move on to somebody else who's willing to spend time with you to figure out what the right dog is for your family right um i'm looking at my questions <laughs> Okay, so I, I do have a, I have two questions. Well, I have three questions, but I have two questions. Um, and one, this is what's interesting to me. And again, it's because, you know, I have the blog and talking with dog trainers like yourself, I've learned these things, but I know in the past I wouldn't have understood. We hired a pet sitter who comes by the house a few days a week to, you know, check in and play with the dogs when we have to work late. And um, when our dogs first met her, Scout would do a low growl mm -hmm. and he's not an aggressive dog, but it made me think about the fact that a lot of people seeing that would assume that, oh, he's aggressive and now he's gonna bite somebody. So what other things can a growl mean? It can mean so much. It's, it's them saying that they're uncomfortable and each dog has in a way different parts of communication that they'll give off first. So my own dog, very little growling from her ever. The only time she'll growl is if a puppy's being really annoying and she wants to tell him like, hey dude, I asked you to leave me alone. No, please, can you leave me alone? And she's like, all right, dude, I seriously mean it this time. <laughs> so it's different ways that they're communicating that they're uncomfortable with something. And if it's responded to, that's fantastic. You want to listen to their body language and their communication, bigger things such as uh, them shying away from you. So um, when I was at your house, uh, there was a lot of dogs around, a lot of things going on and trying to accommodate to all of them, making sure that they're all comfortable. You want to pick the right way to do it. And that just means listen to them. So if they're saying, dude, give me some space at any way that they want to. So if, if Zoe's just kind of shying away and wanting some space, or if Rigo runs up and jumps up on me, or if one of them starts growling, then I go, okay, I'm going to give everybody some space. I'll go say hi to Rodrigo over here. And then the other ones can, can take their time. And I've responded to their signals. Um, 
as well as looking like an aggressive dog, German Shepherds, Dobermans, they all have the look of being a certain way that people can, can already assume things about their behavior. So if a growl comes from a bigger dog, it tends to be taken more seriously than if it's a little dog. Yeah. Um, I find really hard as a trainer, it's, it all means the same thing, no matter the size of the dog or the breed, just, uh, you just have to respond to it. So it doesn't mean they're aggressive. It's just a way of them communicating. They don't, they can't say to us, Hey, please give me some space. I'm not comfortable with this. I need some more time. That's how they do it. They do it with a uh, turning of the head, closing their eyes, going and hiding, growling. Um, and sometimes if that's not listened to, then they take far bigger actions of asking for space, mm -hmm. which a lot of people will say, oh, the dog bit me. But really they were growling and then they did a little snap because they really don't want to be aggressive. They're, they're not, if the dog is aggressive, they will be aggressive. There, there will be no question. But if a dog is asking for space, they're not aggressive. They're trying to avoid being aggressive. Mm -hmm they're listened to, then, then they don't have to escalate any behavior to feel as if they're being heard. So again, it comes all back down to body language. Once you start understanding body language and how to communicate with dogs a little bit more, especially for new owners or people who aren't really used to being with dogs or don't like dogs, if they just know a little bit, that'll really help out a lot. And finally, um, how can someone, so I mean, Living in the Pacific Northwest, I mean, we are such a dog centric area that, you know, I tell people when people ask me, well, I can't find a holistic vet. And I'm like, okay, I can go open the door and go, Hol holistic vet, please. And dog trainer, please. I mean, it's like, if I don't know someone, I know someone that knows 10 someones. And, but, you know, for other parts of the country, what are some, you know, other than, you know, like just doing a Google search, what are some ways that people can find a good trainer in their area? So there are some good, uh, good trainers online, but that can always be a little bit iffy, like if you're looking just on YouTube and stuff. So for people who really need more support or more information that it's hard for them to find in their area, because there are areas where it's limited or people have to really travel somewhere to find the good trainer and not just somebody who's like, yeah, dog train. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> like I've had my own dog, but find who's educated. So especially up here in the Northwest, um, I just graduated from um, Christine Dahl School, um, Northwest School of Canine Studies. Um, which Congratulations. Was Thank you. Um, so we have a whole community of trainers that we have our own group where we can ask other people questions about finding trainers in different areas for clients that are reaching out to us or that are moving. So that way they can continue to find their support. Um, when I first started getting into the training world, I noticed it was really hard to just type in dog trainer and know if you're finding someone that is an ethical trainer, a really good trainer, somebody that you're going to be able to feel support from and trust with to help you with the problems that you're having. Um, so it's, it can be a bit of a challenge and there's no easy answer of, oh, here's a perfect search engine, to find everybody. It's mostly asking questions. And if a trainer is willing to spend a little bit of time with you before you've even signed a contract to train with them or come into a training class or paid for anything. They're at least willing, not necessarily to give you the training information you're looking for, but answer your questions. Those trainers tend to be the more supportive and, mm -hmm. and ethical trainers, as well as knowing what each person is comfortable with doing with their dog. Um, so there's a lot of different training techniques out there. And I'm without going into another whole little, uh, interview that we could do. Um, there's different ways of training with dogs. And if you're not comfortable with something, you don't have to stay with that trainer. Mm -hmm. You can ask for a refund or you can test, uh, fill them out a little bit more, ask them what their policies are or their training techniques are to see if you're even comfortable with it before you try anything on your dog. If the owner, if that trainer is not willing to divulge any of their, te their techniques or explain to you how something is working and why they do it the way that they're doing it, then I would just move on and find someone who's willing to answer your questions. Yeah. I, I, it's interesting that you say that because it reminded me that our very first, when I got Rodrigo and Sydney, so that was nearly eight years ago, um, I had the same struggle where um, everyone I was finding were people who, oh, I have dogs and I've had them all my life, so now I'm a dog trainer. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, I didn't understand the difference between, I didn't understand that people actually went to school to learn these things. And um, 
but another trainer in Oregon found me the trainer that I have here. And what's interesting about it is that when I was looking for a trainer initially, I just couldn't find anyone. Yeah. I knew I didn't want to go to the pet store. I wanted someone who came to our home. And um, it was so hard, but now that I know where to look, they're everywhere. So it's like, and I also think the industry is growing. Um, yeah. So it's really amazing to see. Yeah, we're definitely, there's definitely a lot more growth in this industry now that people are owners, not just people that like, so there's dog people like us who really go out and seek these things. And, and we really want to make a difference in some part of the dog world, but dog owners who just want a lovely family member to add in, they know they need to do some training. They know they're going to need a, somebody to help with day visits or boarding, or even just watching their dog while they're at work. And having more outlets is definitely and with Facebook and Instagram and all this this social media is really helping for a lot of the good stuff that we have in this dog community. So trying to find a, a better hub for it would be great, but there's just so much of it that exploring your area. And then if you can't find something directly in your area, try reaching out to some of the schools um, if it's possible saying, hey, where are your dog trainers? Where are they out in this in this world? I need them. Um, that that can definitely help a lot. So, um, and if they find somebody that they're working with, they that they really like, like, all right, you know, I know you're not going to be always available. Who else would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Always build a bigger and bigger circle of people. And I always have people that I want to refer. Uh, I have clients that I need to refer off to other people because our schedules are too crazy, or they don't line up, or they're just in a different area. And it's I need somebody farther north than somebody farther down into Seattle because I'm right in between. And that that helps a lot. That those trainers will have a circle of people that they know too. Fantastic. Well, Fiona, thank you so much for spending the morning with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I was really excited. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to pause and now. Okay, so, oh no, I didn't want to do that. Cancel.